Hello friends, welcome to AI Flux. So today we're talking about GPUs, specifically the GPU haves, the GPU have nots, and depending on which of those groups you're in, whether or not you should actually go out and try to build a foundational language learning model or some wild AI project. So in the last year, we've seen wild advancements in AI, and there've been three huge sources of these advancements. So transformers are the bedrock of all of this rapid transformation of the AI space. They made things possible that we thought were impossible mere years ago. And the last two sources are kind of interesting. So initially we had huge models from massive organizations like OpenAI and Google, uh, GPT-2, GPT-3, uh, or both from OpenAI. These were massive, incredibly huge models that required monumental amounts of computation to make. And we also had models like Mina from Google, which now have led us to the tools they have today. Now what's interesting is there's a question here. Um, the final group are fine-tuned LLMs that do really narrow things specifically very well, but they all seem to rely on the base models coming from these huge companies. And most of sort of these smaller advancements are also coming uh, from the open source world. And it's kind of interesting. So A16Z or Anderson Horowitz, a VC firm in the Valley, decided to describe this in kind of a peculiar way by describing companies that have access to endless fields of GPUs generally the fastest GPUs, um, or even things that aren't even GPUs, things like TPUs from Google or other dedicated compute for AI as the GPU rich. And for anyone like you and me who might even have, you know, one to 40 RTX 4090, or maybe even access to a few thousand A100s as the GPU poor. The difference being that the things that we can accomplish as the GPU poor are distinctly different from what the GPU rich can do or are even working on. Um, basically, A16Z argues that there are certain things that the GPU poor shouldn't even try to do. And the implications of this are kind of interesting, and I'm not sure I entirely agree with it. But in this video, we're just covering their paradigm of GPU rich and GPU poor. So this is the page where Anderson Horowitz initially announced this. And like any good VC grift, this was all based on a meme from XKCD, which uh, goes like this. So we have an amazing new AI app, which seemingly is a bunch of little pieces built on these larger blocks. And at the very bottom, we have uh, the very insignificant Reddit commenter fine-tuning Llama 7B on dual 4090s. And basically the joke here is that there's no way anyone with two 4090s would be able to compile anything close to GPT-4, GPT-3, or even GPT-2.5. Obviously GPUs are getting faster, but the amount of data you have to crunch is insurmountable for small GPU users. And this is basically the argument A16Z has made. So this is not all doom and gloom though, because A16Z is using this as an opportunity to support smaller players in AI. So let me read a little bit of this and I think you'll get a sense of what they mean by this. So A16Z says, we believe artificial intelligence has the power to save the world and that thriving open source ecosystems are essential to build this future, which basically means they think there are dollar signs in here somewhere. Um, thankfully, the open source ecosystem is starting to develop and we are now seeing open source models that rival closed source alternatives. These would be things like WizardLM, uh, GGML, uh, to name a few. Uh, hundreds of small teams and individuals are also working to make these models more useful, accessible, and performant. So basically, they're really nicely saying are building wrappers around these models. Uh, these projects push the state of the art in open source AI and help provide a more robust, comprehensive understanding of the technology. They include instruction tuning based LLMs, removing censorship from LLM outputs, and optimizing models for low powered machines and building novel tooling for model inference, researching LLM security issues, and more. However, and this is the important part, the people behind these projects don't often have the resources available to pursue their work to conclusion or maintain it in the long run, especially in comparison to huge organizations like Google and Meta. The situation is more acute in AI than traditional infrastructure since even fine-tuning models require significant GPU computing resources, and in other words, it's just very expensive. And as a result, they've released basically a fund to fund some of these projects. Um, what's cool is I know it was some, some of these guys, so Jeremy Howard, uh, Tom Jobbins, The Bloke. I also know uh, Technim and Ubuguga. These are very big players in the Twitter space and they've done a lot of cool work. And what's cool is a lot of this work is really pretty addressable if you just know a fair bit of Python or if you remember enough linear algebra from college. And they're being clear here that it's a grant fund, not a safe note. So basically it means that their, v their grubby VC hands will not be all over this work and it will remain open source. So that's their starting point. And I would argue that with a lot of what George Haas has been working on with TinyGrad, 
uh, that it kind of blows this whole paradigm out of the water, along with the fact that uh, I've been providing and uh, using GPUs from Vast AI for quite some time, and the demand for GPUs there and also the demand for all sorts of GPUs on platforms like TensorDoc is only increasing. So unless there are just endless amounts of clueless people working on LLMs, I would sort of disagree with this. But the analysis gets even more interesting. And this is because um, if we look back at sort of the foundational advancements in AI that pushed us into this amazing year we've had, um, a lot of it is keyed on the Google MENA model and a sort of internal memo written by a researcher at Google named Nam Shazir. And he titled this paper, Mina Eats the World. And basically in this memo, he predicted many of the things that the rest of the world would eventually realize uh, after the release of ChatGPT. Basically his key takeaways were that language models would get increasingly integrated into our lives in a variety of ways to a point that we would have to use them for almost everything and that a few huge companies would generally dominate the globally deployed flops uh, of compute available. Um, he was so far ahead of his time that he, when he wrote this, uh, it was actually mostly ignored and laughed at. Noam was also um, notably a part of the original Transformer paper, Attention is All You Need, and uh, he was also one of the first to work on concepts for modern uh, mixture of experts notions, which is now um, what powers all of GPT-4, which is pretty crazy. So his overwhelming point here was that Google had the keys to the kingdom and they just spilled them out all over the floor and we picked up the pieces and managed to put them together in a way that has now given everyone else the advancement, which is pretty much how I would describe why the last year has been such a wild time. Obviously, Google has been not really competitive with, with GPT-4, but I would argue that with how much compute Google has, with, which generally is the most GPU compute in the entirety of North America, there are big bets being made that Google will actually pull ahead and have something better than uh, GPT-4, because in theory, um, TPU v5 has now been released. We're making a video about that. And those are multiple orders of magnitude faster than the H100. Now, these details aside, who are the GPU poor? So there are a whole host of startups and open source researchers who are struggling with fewer GPUs. They're spending significant time and effort attempting to do things that simply don't help or really matter in terms of the larger research initiatives at these huge companies. For example, they'll spend a ton of time um, fine-tuning models where they don't have enough RAM to really uh, fully imagine or appreciate the capabilities of what they're working on. And some would argue this is really counterproductive and, some, and in some ways a waste of skills and time. Which by that, they just mean they'd be better off working at larger companies and giving them the gains there. These startups and open source researchers are using larger LLMs to fine-tune smaller models and they're chasing leaderboard style benchmarks that really have broken evaluation methods, and we've talked about this before on this channel. The issue is it's getting harder and harder to actually measure against these models, and although you know being efficient with GPUs is important, um, what's being ignored is they're not really concerned with efficiency at scale, and their time isn't being spent productively, which commercially um, in their GPU poor environment is just kind of irrelevant, um, especially since in time, the market will be flooded by more than 3.5 million H100s by the end of next year. And that's just with what NVIDIA can make now with Taiwan um, still on the face of the earth. The other thing with the GPU poor is they're still mostly using dense models because that's what Meta has graciously given all of us to work with. So these are like the Llama series of models and um, some others that have been fine tuned a little more graciously. Um, some would argue if they were actually concerned with the efficiency, especially on the client side, they'd be running sparse architectures like um, mixture of experts and training on larger data sets that use things like speculative decoding, uh, similar to what OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, and DeepMind have done. So what do we do here? Like, so what do we do as the GPU poor collectively? How can we band together to still contribute to AI and not be erased by these massive companies that have way more money than all of us? Some researchers have argued that the GPU poor should be focusing on trade-offs that improve model performance or token-to-token -token latency by upping compute and memory capacity requirements in favor of reduced memory bandwidth because that's kind of what the edge needs. So pretty much what this means is focusing on making these models usable on smaller devices and making them faster. And I would argue that the best examples of this are the GGML project, which is taking a lot of conventional models and making them run wildly fast on uh, Apple M2 CPUs which in my opinion is a really great use of time because if you're getting it to run on an M2, 
architecturally that's very similar to iPads and uh, iPhones and all kinds of smaller Apple devices. Eventually, I'm sure we'll see an LLM that actually runs on an Apple Watch. So there are those kinds of things. Uh, there are also the kind of things like coding assistants that can run locally. So for instance, I run Wizard LM on a, a handful of RTX 3090s, sometimes some 4090s. And that's where we can really uh, focus on. Of building foundational models in this way is maybe just not realistic yet. Uh, I think George Hotz may have something to say about that. And it's important to note that being GPU poor isn't limited to only scrappy startups. Uh, some of the most recognized AI firms like Hugging Face, uh, Mosaic ML, are also uh, in the same club uh, as our GPU poor brethren. And I say this because they really only make money or have a model that works if there are lots of GPU pores following them. Uh, of course, now with Hugging Face, um, they have a offering where you can spin up a cluster of H100s with them. However, the issue is that um, for Hugging Face to even exist, there always need to be GPU pores using their services, and not really in ways that are making money. NVIDIA's DGX Cloud is arguably a much better offering for enterprise, and they're optimizing this day after day as we're just toiling around trying to make cool anime images with our RTX 3090s or a rented A40 on Hugging Face. So in conclusion, I'm still happy to be GPU poor. I will be very okay with my RTX 4090s and my 3090s. I still feel like I derive quite a bit of value and joy and that I've learned a lot working with these models as a GPU poor. Uh, sometimes I've been blessed with having a small machine of eight H100s and um, that feels really fancy, but yeah, do you feel like you're part of the GPU poor group? Do you work at Google and uh, are you a shepherd for the GPU rich? Uh, do you want to hear about what it means to be GPU rich and some of the more businessy uh, implications of this? We can definitely get into that if you guys would like us to. Uh, but yeah, so I hope you like this new format. Um, the algorithms changed a bit, so our content will also start to change a bit. And I think we're going to move into some of these more video uh, essay type videos. So if you like this, let me know. Uh, if you think we should change, let me know. I can definitely say the video we put up yesterday was not popular. So um, as always, I hope you learned something. If you enjoy our content, please like and subscribe. And if you want to rent a really fast GPU for almost no money and support your GPU poor brothers, um, check out our link below for Vast AI. It'll give you a good deal, and uh, we know the devs, and they do a good job. So see you in the next video.